Hi everyone, welcome, welcome um, to this to, the, to today's lecture. Um, we're just waiting for people to come in. Um, we have quite a few people in already, but we're just waiting for a few more and then we'll start today's proceedings. So bear with us for a few moments. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. Please remember to keep your mics off um, and we will be fielding questions after the lecture um, in the chat. So I can get, so I will read the, the questions from the chat to Dr. Pendleton, right? So bear with us for a couple of minutes. Let's see if we can get more people in. Okay, Dr. Guy, it's 10 o'clock. I think you can begin. Good morning and welcome to the second of our lecture series from the city of Vlissinga to New Walcheren, the Dutch in the West Indies. Thank you. This morning, I would like to introduce, uh, as a matter of fact, I'd like to say thank you to our sponsor, the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Port of Spain, Ambassador Rafael Varga. Also, I would like to thank the trade attaché, Mr. Lindley Giban, for his assistance with this lecture series. Also, the National Trust Historic Trust of Trinidad and Tobago for their support. All the technical details, they have been very helpful in providing um, this for the um, lecture series. I would like to welcome Mr. Jerome Keynes Dumas, the former chief administrator of the Tobago House of Assembly also trained in Netherlands, trained in the Netherlands, and a certified diver who worked with the Scarborough Harbor Project on the dive program and the archeological project that we did in the Rockley Bay. Thank you. And I welcome Mr. Jerome Keynes Dumas. You're new, Jerome, you're new.
Are you hearing me? Loud and clear. Okay, well, a pleasant good morning and a pleasant good afternoon to all. Today is a beautiful day on the island of Tobago, and I'm glad to be here with you at this time to introduce Dr. Rita Pemberton. Dr. Pemberton is a former senior lecturer and head of the Department of History at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. She has taught the history of Trinidad and Tobago, imperialism, and various aspects of Caribbean history at UWI, St. Augustine from 1990 through to 2013. She is a former Deputy Dean Student Affairs in the Faculty of Humanities and Education at UWI, St. Augustine, and she has served the Caribbean Examinations Council, CXC that is, as a member of the CSEC Caribbean History Examination Team since the year 2000, and as Chief Examiner, Caribbean History from 2008 to 2016. She was a visiting scholar at JNU University, New Delhi, India, and a visiting researcher at Warwick University in the United Kingdom. She was a member of a collaborative research team with researchers from Benin, Africa, and Brazil, which examined the cholera pandemic out outbreak of the 1850s. The results of her research have been published as chapters in several books and in academic journals, and she is the lead author of the History Dictionary, or rather the Historical Dictionary of Trinidad and Tobago 2018. Her research focus is on health, environment, and culture in Caribbean history and the history of Trinidad and Tobago. She is currently working on a history of Tobago. I must say it is with great honor and a distinct pleasure to invite my friend and sister of the Tobago soil to present Tobago's lecture or today's lecture in this series of enlightening virtual sessions, Dr. Rita Pemberton. We're hearing you. you can go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, me. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Jerome, for your kind introduction. I want to take the opportunity to thank the Dr. Guy and her team of organizers and supporters who established the series. And I am particularly pleased to be a part of this program because those of us in and of Tobago have been very, very anxious to have um, some clarity brought to those missing parts of the island's history. So this is a very, very welcome intervention. So without further ado, I want to get down to the presentation. And um, we will be looking at, as the title suggests, Dutch activity in the Caribbean with special reference to Tobago. We begin with our discussion on the topic Dutch colonial enterprise in the 17th century Caribbean with special reference to Tobago. The objectives are to explain the factors which influenced European activity in the region, identify the Dutch possessions in the Caribbean, show the role of the Dutch in the 17th century Caribbean, explain the dri driving forces behind Dutch colonial activity, and describe this activity in Tobago during the 17th century and its impact. First of all, we look at Europe because everything that happened in the Caribbean has its relevance and relationship to what was happening in Europe. So century, century, century Caribbean featured largely in Europe's uh, in, in Europe, because one, 
The perception in the, of the value of colonies had changed. It had been before that a focus on extracting gold and, and silver, but now the move was to agricultural pursuits. It was realized that the increase in trade and wealth generation with, um, through agriculture was greater than previously thought, but to practice agriculture, you re require to have permanent settlement. And so these colonies became important, not only as wealth generators, but also as signifiers of European wealth and influence. So the Dutch introduced sugar processing technology to the French West Indies, um, Barbados and St. Kitts all at the same time. So the, the returns that that turned caused the Dutch to be elevated into an important power. And every important power, like, and like we saw with Spain before, had the problem of stimulating the jealousy and competition of its rival. The high prices for sugar did that. So what we have in the 17th century Caribbean was a scramble for colonial possessions. You know, we talk about the scramble for, for Africa, but there was a scramble for the Caribbean territories during the 17th and early part of the 18th century. Now, when we talk about Dutch colonial activity, we have to talk about the Dutch West India Company, which was the body which directed this activity. This was a chartered company of merchants and they had the monopoly of trade in the Dutch West Indies. And so they became important, not only in the Dutch West Indies because as traders, they were involved in a significant part of the trade of the British and French Caribbean. Between 1630 and 1654, Dutch business was centered in Pernambuco, supplying Africans to the Caribbean territories to feed the sugar plantations, which required enslaved neighbor. And we have some figures here. The Dutch supplied numbers to every territory in the Caribbean that was involved in the slave business. Right, so now we could look at the Dutch possessions. Um, I think we are most familiar with the ABC, Aruba, Curaçao, and Bonaire. Then there's Seba, St. Martin, and St. Eustatius up in the Northern Caribbean. And on the mainland, Essequibo, Demerara, Berbis, and the other one would be Suriname. Okay. So we have some little bits on each territory. Uh, what I want to show is that each Dutch possession played a significant role in its trading system. So Aruba was used mainly from the time it was it up, uh, fully occupied by the Dutch. It was mainly to protect the salt supply. And salt was an important trading item during the period of enslavement. Now, the Dutch obtained their salt then from South America and therefore to bring it to the Caribbean and distribute to all the areas with which the Dutch traded, Aruba was the center. And like everything else, each of these territories faced competition, so they were always changing hands, as we will see some of them more than the other. Bonaire. Bonaire, after it became a British possession in 1633, uh, enslaved Africans were introduced to cut dyewoods and cultivate maize, but it became an important, a thriving salt production of a center. So, and as a, a slave market for the plantation economy of Curacao. So, um, the last point I made the salt pans and slave huts can still be seen on the landscape, present day landscape of Bonaire. Okay, so we have salt. Now we have Curacao. And Curacao was the trading center for the Dutch West India Company because its harbor was safe. Uh, it, it was positioned to re receive food items from South America and from all over. 
and then it was, was a supplier to the plantations of South America. The salt trade that we mentioned before in the case of Bonaire was critical for the herring tree. That is, the, it was used for salt and fish. So it was a, a preservation. And so Curacao was one territory, one Dutch territory was frequently attacked by privateers and, and, other, um, and other entities such as the British. We, they were interested in uh, taking over anything that was uh, generating revenue became attracted, attractive to the Europeans. So until 1816, um, it was, there was always this to and fro in changing hands and attacks. 1816, it was fully Dutch and has remained a Dutch possession until it gained its semi-independence. The Guyanas, the Dutch established three colonies in the Guyanas, Essequibo, Berbice, and Demerara. They were located on the rivers quite naturally because the Dutch was looking at how it could move its trade. And the Dutch West Indian Company in the early in the 17th century came to control the trade along the rivers. And then the next characteristic we will see in the settlement pattern of the Dutch was apart from seeking to locate itself in an area where it was strategically located to conduct its trade. Once it's established, its next business was to protect its operations. So they built forts. So in Guyana, there are three main forts built to protect the sugar cultivation that was going on and the, the export factor, the import of the items needed by the industry and the export of the sugar cane. And then I get the part of survival in Guyana had to do with dealing with the drainage problems. So the Dutch introduced a number of drainage systems, canals, dams, and so on, all um, intended to control the flow of water. So the, the, what happened in the Guyanas, several plantations were established. And you know, there was no problem there for space. So these plantations were large, but the colonies were frequently attacked and they changed hands several times, Spanish one day, Portuguese the next week, English. And that is how it went until the Dutch was able to maintain some control. If eventually in the next century, it lost out to the Dutch. To the English, sorry. Saber. Saber is a rock, virtually a rock. And it is strange that there was so much interest in such a small bit of territory. It changed hands 12 times. And it was claimed by Englishmen, Dutchmen, Frenchmen, and um, Eventually, it fell into Dutch hands, and the Dutch settlers were first evicted. The first set that were evicted in 1665 were sent to St. Martin, but after that, it was occupied by the Dutch and then taken back by the British, and then 1816, permanently Dutch. So... But the thing about Saber, it, again, it is its location. It was not suitable for plantation type activity, but it was in the business world that those connections were established. Okay. St. Eustatius. Again, the Dutch West India Company introduced sugar and tobacco into St. Eustatius. And it was considered value, although it is a small piece of territory, its strategic lo location was of high value to the Dutch because it facilitated trade between the Dutch and the British, Danish, French, and Spanish West Indian colonies. So it served as a free port for the transshipment of goods, and it became a center for contraband trade, which was highly valuable to the Dutch economy. In 1776, the sale of arms and ammunition to the United States of the fight, the war in the United States produced 
a great deal of her revenue to the Dutch. And so St. Eustatius was of central value to the Dutch economy. Now, I want us to remember the strategic location and the connectivity between each one of the items within the Dutch empire. So um, again, in the case of St. Eustatius, it was fought out in, this, in the next century, 1780, and became a fully Dutch colony in 1784. Okay. Now, the other highly valued colony, land-based colony, was Suriname. And li like the rest, Suriname was fought over French settlement, English settlers, and Dutch. Um, in this, the beginning of the century, 16th, sorry, at the beginning of the 17th century, it was a Dutch trading center because goods had to be moved across the South American landmass. The English settlers moved in in 1630, cultivating tobacco, which was attracting a very high price on the European market. And then the French came and dropped themselves in 1640 on the Suriname River. Then the British went and they established themselves on a colony on another river under Lord Willoughby. But then the Dutch invaded in 1667 to try to take it, the territory back. They introduced a number of crops, sugar, coffee, cocoa, cotton, and enslaved Africans to um, serve on the plantation. And again, the rewards from, from trade in Europe stimulated the British to come back and try again in 1799, 1816 it was written to the Dutch. So what do we have? We have a number of islands which reflect Dutch involvement in the region, some of them carrying more signs of a Dutch presence than others, and we will explain why later. So now we come to Tobago. Why was, we will try to find out why the Dutch was interested in Tobago. Between 1628 and 1677, the Dutch occupation occurred in Tobago amid a period of fierce European rivalry, the same scramble for territory which I made reference to earlier on. The Dutch came to Tobago and the Europeans also came to Tobago. But neither of, neither of the Europeans who were involved in this fierce rivalry initially thought of any importance of the first people. And so we have in the literature, somebody in Europe, in England, describing the presence uh, in, in Tobago of just a few, there was nobody there except a few Caribs and stranded whalers. So nothing of consequence, this is open for the Dutch uh, or the British. But the Dutch was attracted to Tobago for several reasons. One, the harbors. Two, the strategic location between the Dutch mainland possessions and the Caribbean islands of the coast of Brazil and Guyana. So that items could be moved from one place to the other easily. And then the, the, the strategic location had to do with the position of the island a little bit off the, the archipelago. So it, you can make access easy, access and exit easily. But then there was also a belief that Tobago could provide a very um, rich reward in terms of tobacco cultivation because of the belief that tobacco grows best in Tobago. The first settlement was called New Walcheren. It was financed by Jean de Moore, the mayor of Flushing in the province of Zeeland in Holland. And 
John Nemour had been a businessman. He has he had established trading posts in the Guyanas before, and the Dutch West India Company gave him exclusive rights to the Tobago colony. So this colony of 100 persons in the first instance was established on the leeward side, Plymouth, Cole, and Blackhorn area. And again, the first thing that they sought to give attention to was the establishment of fortresses. So two were established, uh, one in New Flushing on the Southwest Plymouth and a small one, a smaller one in Black Rock. And everywhere the Dutch went, they set up fortresses. But then in the spirit of the competition and the scramble for territory, there were times, many times of attack and re-attack and response. But as I said earlier, they did not bargain for attacks of the first people. So you had first people groups coming from Grenada and St. Vincent attacking those Europeans who came to Tobago. The reasons for this interest by the first people from Grenada and St. Vincent are, are twofold. One, they are relative relatives right, they are relatives. So they are related groups and they also felt a strong sense of kin. But also the first people had their own interest in Tobago. We talk about European trade, but the first people had their own trade. Tobago was a trading center. Again, it's strategic position to move items up to the islands, up further north and down to the territories further south. So this was in danger of being disrupted by a European presence. So the, the first people gave so much trouble to the first Dutch settlers that the settlement was temporarily abandoned in 1630. The arrival of new settlers in 1633 and the Dutch setting up an alliance. So now uh, this, this, is, this is what where it gets very interesting that the French, well, the Europeans generally were trying to establish themselves by seeking alliance with or alliances with the first people groups. So the Dutch in 1633 set up such an alliance with the Nipolo group in East Trinidad for trade. This sent alarm, section, sec, alarm sentiments to the Spanish authorities in Trinidad. And so they attacked the Dutch settlement. And then that attack was followed by, in 1637, by an English attempt to set, settle Tobago. And they had the same medicine from the first people who chased them out. And by 1639, the Colanders arrived in Tobago. And the Colanders have a role because um, as we will see, the Europeans forged relationships with anyone who, they felt could help them at any point in time. So they were kind of philanderers with their relationships. There was no sense of loyalty to anyone. It was just, I needed to get this thing done. And if you could help me, I will lean on you. And then afterwards, I, I wouldn't be ashamed to attack you. So. So yes, after the, the Colanders. And then there's no settlement, there's no no peace, you have attacks from the first people continuing. And then you have enslaved Africans being introduced in growing numbers and whose problems, whose issues, whose desire for freedom are uh, growing stronger and louder and demonstrated in all kinds of resistant activity. But they were made to cultivate tobacco. And in the face of all that, the British were still trying between 1639 and 1643. And the Colanders who had been beaten back initially come back to make another try in 16, between 1642 and 1650. So by the middle of the 17th century, um, Tobago was largely unoccupied by Europeans because they had all been defeated by the first people's attempts to defend what they considered rightfully their territory. So in 1654, 
the Dutch and the Colanders sort of worked hand in hand. The Colanders came with a mixed group of settlers um, who planted themselves around the old Dutch fortifications in Plymouth. And, you know, it is said that this operation was largely founded by the Dutch because they were determined to maintain a, firm and, a permanent foothold on Tobago. This new settlement in 1654 was renamed the New Colon. But what, what the Dutch did, as I talked about philandering relationships, in addition to this mixed group, which had some Dutch members in it, a group of Dutch settlers arrived and they settled on the other side of the island. Uh, Rootcliff Blay, Redcliff, Rootcliff was the Dutch for Redcliff or Rockley Bay in English. And you will see if you read anything that Rootcliff has various forms of spelling. The Colanders were at first unaware of this Dutch presence. They, when they found out, they were quite naturally concerned and angry and they overrun, overrun the Dutch encampment. So that put them back on the same position which they started being rivals and competitors for the Tobago space. So the Dutch attempt a second settlement. Um, it was influenced, financed by the wealthy Lamson's brothers and um, we have um, the one of them, Cornelius, being pictured here. So they did a settlement on the windward side of the island to form a colony, of, which developed from a colony of Tutelas at Minister B. It spread to Mount St. George, Hillsborough area, Barbados Bay, and south to Petit Tree and Little Rockley Bay. So they definitely had, had plans for permanent settlement this time around. There's cultivation, a water mill was established on the, on the Hillsborough River. The Labsons family had uh, six animal drawn well mills. Cultivation spread all the way down to Petit True and um, there were houses, huts established at Canobie and a small group of houses at Sandy Bay. So it was spreading on the side of the, the, the island, right down. And the, the Dutch colony seemed to be poised to strive. Sugarcane, tobacco, indigo, ginger, ginger, and provisions were the main means of, the, of, of um, support, but people made a living by hunting, Turtling and forestry. The green turtles were uh, a delicacy that was highly valued. The, the, what is now the rainforest did have a bounty of items for hunting. And so these are how the Dutch occupied themselves. A, a, a village was built near the beach. There was a long street um, along the beach, and this was um, connected with the Lamsons estates their cattle farms and the sugar estate. And what was the Lamson's estate is the site on which the present day Bacolet estate is located. So what they did having um, gotten, expanded themselves and ousted the, the, um, the arrivals on the other side of the island, they incorporated the Coronian colony and built their own sugar mill at Plymouth and they established three fortifications. So they took over the Fort Jacobus, which was set up by the, the Latvians, renamed it Fort Beveron after the governor of the Lamsingbird colony. And so the Dutch established two more. Defense was an important, as I indicated at the start, um, at, Lams at Lamsenburg, so their barracks were established and as an arsenal for to strengthen their defense system. The governor's residence was located close by, south of, in the southeast of the Steel River near to Mount Mary. And then in order to monitor 
the movement of the first people, but now they have a sense that the first people are going to respond. And so they track their, their movements to the south of the island. So they constructed a small temporary, a redo, as it's called, a temporary, a temporary military installment, which was called Bel Vista in the Boku Mount urban area. So now, okay, the Dutch are there, the Colanders were there. The Colanders were attacked by the first people. And the Dutch instigated this riot of the remaining Colanders, and then they took over the Colander settlement. And then the, the first people turned their arms on the Dutch in 1660, trying to get them out. So that we see a consistent um, resistant effort, resistant and death and, and defense effort by the first people on the European encroachers onto the territory. And so now the thing about the Dutch is that it was put under siege by the Europeans because of the European competitors because there was a determination to wipe them out. Now, the whole system of European rivalry was based on exclusion. If I got into an operation, I have to exclude my competitors in order to protect the returns that I expect to get from my territories. So there were a series of Anglo-Dutch wars in which the Dutch suffered terribly. In 1660, yes, it was a British attack, but there were buccaneers who came and destroyed the, the Dutch settlement. The Dutch built back in 1668, and they brought in new settlers and they attempted to, to rebuild Lampsinstad. But they faced an attack of the very people they had sought to ally with earlier, the Nepolos. And Another set of, a different set of indigenous people assisted the Dutch against the Nepolos. And then you had a third Anglo-Dutch war in 1674, when at the end of which the colony was awarded to the Dutch. So what you are happening now is a lack of stability, a lack of continuity, and that is certainly affecting the whole uh, viability of the operation. And it becomes costly because every war and every destruction means uh, a cost to restart and a cost for defense. So a third settlement attempt was made between Rockley Bay and Minister Bay. So that would be Scarborough to Bucklet, but that didn't survive, survive very long. And the fourth, fourth settlement came heavily concentrated around Scarborough as they call it, root pipley, plantations of sugar, cotton, ginger, cassava, corn, and peas, and a new fort. Now, the new fort is instructed. It is um, what we will call Dutch Fort. It was in that location. And this was a star fort. It was shaped like a star. And it was to be a supreme defense mechanism for the Dutch, having had the experience of British attacks and the attacks of the first people. And so what in this revised Dutch settlement of the area, the chapel that was left by the um, Latvian group was converted to an arsenal. Defense is important. And when you are up on that hill, you have a good view of who is approaching and a hospital. And they had a strong defense, 480 people and 23 cannons guarding the town. But the French made a very devastating attack in the Battle of Rockley Bay that most of us would have heard about or read something about that occurred in March 1677, which wiped out the Dutch settlement in Tobago, almost without a trace. Much of what was left were some of the cannon up on Dutch Fort and most of what remains lie under the sea. So what do we conclude from all this? 
Dutch colonial enterprise reflected its imperial designs. Like other European countries, it sought to, be rec to establish itself and to be recognized as an imperial power. Very early on, the Dutch recognized the value of free. So while the Spaniards and other Europe, French and other Europeans and the British were fighting to get their hands on Spanish gold and silver from the Americas, the Dutch recognized the value of carrying the trade between these warring countries. As a, a consequence, it built up a fantastic trading network that brought returns, which stimulated the jealousy and continued attacks of its rivals. But in the, uh, its attempt to extend and secure its trade, it created an integrated trade network. So it established strategically located trade centers. So these centers would serve north, south, east, and west. So we have Curacao, bringing in business that came from Panama and parts of South America. Then you have the Guyanas, which would handle trade, which could be easily transported to um, any of the Caribbean networks. And so this is where Tobago came in. Where did Tobago fit into the Dutch system? So we talked about Curacao and the southern portion. We talked about salt from Bonaire coming over and, and, and Bonaire also serving to provide labor to Curacao. And then we talked about the northern part of the South American mainland on the Guyanas and their locations within each easy reach to the Caribbean territories. And this is where Tobago was supposed to be, supposed was intended to be placed. It was to provide that essential link between the mainland in the south and the islands of the north. And the rest of the Dutch system had those northern Caribbean territories, St. Eustatius, et cetera, which would handle business further north and deal with supplying the entire region through this Dutch network. Unfortunately, its colonizing efforts in Tobago remained short term. Uh, it wasn't able to establish the permanent, a permanent presence in Tobago. So at this point, we do not have much in terms of Dutch, not toponyms, names, nothing to show. Um, the Dutch permanent, where they, they never had a long enough time on Tobago to make an impact on the culture. There are a few names hanging around, but not too many. So it was short term, a short term effort, but an important one. It indicated how the Europeans viewed Tobago in that period of time. It also gave us an, an opportunity to assess the indigenous people and the role that they played in Tobago during this period. And as I said at the start, we considered very much what the European trade was and how it was organized. And we have to remember that in the 17th century, one of the clashes we had was not simply a clash of Europeans versus first people. It was European trade system clashing with a well-established trading system among the different groups of indigenous people who occupied the region. In the long run though, the volume of its trade, that is the Dutch trade, attracted its rivals. And what made it so very unsavory to its rivals is that the Dutch were trading with their own territories. Now we should remember that it was the Dutch who introduced sugar cultivation to the Caribbean and which fostered such wealth to its rivals, Britain and France. But they were not great for rivals. They still sought to add to their returns from sugar production by excluding the Dutch, who was considered 
chief rivals. And so it is this rivalry, this, this volume of trade that was so bountiful to the Dutch that attracted its rivals and ended its colonizing efforts in Tobago. So this brought the end, the, this closed the chapter of the Dutch and its colonizing efforts in Tobago. I want to thank everyone for listening, and I hope that you have volumes of questions to ask. I have a question. Um, Mr. Nathan, could you put your question in the chat? Um, could you type your question in the chat? Text, it, text the question. Yes, please. Okay, will do. Thank you. All right, everyone, thank you so much, Dr. Pemberton, for that um, enlightening lecture. Um, that, that lecture was recorded before we began this morning in case something would need to happen with our connection. But we have Dr. Pemberton here live and in the flesh to answer some of the questions that you have. So please take this opportunity to, to type your questions in the chat and we'll get to them. Hopefully we'll get to all of them. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone, for those who came late, the, a recording of this lecture will, will be sent, a uh, link of it will be sent to the participants, all the participants who register, so you'll be able to, to watch it at your leisure. So, um, Dr. Pemberton, would you like to say anything before we begin the questions? No, I'm, I'm, I'm just ready for quest to respond to whatever questions are put before me. Okay, so we have um, two so far. Let me just get this up. We have two so far. Um, the first one is, remember, you mentioned a redo in Bel Vista. Um, someone asks, where is that redo? That was somewhere in the Buku area. You're not, you're not sitting exactly I can't there. say precisely where it is. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the sources, my sources have indicated that it was located in the Buku area, and um, that's as far as I could see. Okay. Um, another question, you, you mentioned a lot of the Corlanders. Um, someone is asking for some clarification on who the Corlanders, who were the Corlanders? So maybe you could have like this. The Corlanders were the residents or well it, it wasn't a nation but the the people who lived under what was then the duchy of Courland, and that is present day latvia so if you see Courlanders and latvia same that's the same um geographical they come from the same geographical area okay um Someone asks about Lampsinsburg. Can it be identified with the current location on the island? Scarborough. Scarborough itself? Yes. Okay. That's very interesting. So um, has there, well, for me, I just want to ask, has there, any, has there been any archaeological um, evidence of this early um, town below Scarborough? Has anybody ever... Well, I, I don't I don't know that that kind of archaeology has been done, but you know that Tobago really has um, had a deficit of archaeological activity and yeah. there's so much need for much more. Yes. Yeah. Let me see some more questions. Well, if I... Oh, oh we, we have... have sorry, sorry. Hi, sorry. Hi. We have Ari. Hi, guys. Um, oh, yes, yeah, we have Ari. All right, all right. <laughs> Thank you for your lecture, uh, Rita, well, uh, as far as we know, the Lumsinsburg uh, fortification was at the same place as the later Stereschans, which Binkus uh, had constructed. Oh, yeah. It was simply at the same place. And uh, yeah, as what we find up there are uh, typically Dutch bricks and, and all that kind of thing. Before uh, most of the uh, uh, Dutch forts, the area was, was uh, uh, 
paved. And um, there are still quite some bricks and, and, and uh, pottery and uh, uh, iron pieces dating from the 17th century to be found up there. But um, at first I felt that the Lanzensburg fortress was somewhere further down Lower Town because actually Lower Town is uh, the Lanzensburg uh, of Lanzenstadt, uh, the, the, the town Lanzenstown, it's literally. Um, but now I'm convinced that it was simply that fortress of the Lamsins was at the same place where uh, uh, Binkus or Benkus, whatever you call him, uh, made his fort to withstand the French, which he didn't succeed in. There is one thing I, I, I wish to point out that L in Rock Lee Bay is the Dutch L. <laughs> That's one of the few things still That's reminding nice. of the Dutch period in Tobago, because normally you would call such a, 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 a harbor, such a, such a, a place, a Rocky Bay huh, in English, Rocky Bay. No, it's called Rock Lee Bay. And that is after Rode Klibai, literally Red Cliff Bay, which is uh, the name the Dutch gave to the bay because of the uh, red rocks in the, at the entrance of, of the bay, uh, which you, uh, the red rocks, uh, which you see also at Lambo, uh, at, at uh, that point. Anyway, that L is a Dutch L, I insist on that. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Boomert. I'd like to identify Dr. Boomert as the, the most foremost archaeologist dealing with um, Trinidad and Tobago archaeology. Um, he is really, well, it's really appreciated you. that um, I really appreciate your input in this. And, um, you know, there's more information in your book, of course. I'm sure everybody knows your book. Yes, so, Professor okay. Boomert. We are happy to have a piece of the Dutch. So would you say that, <laughs> that, that the L in Rockley Vale also yeah. comes from the right. Dutch? Okay, the Dutch, I will note that we have identified two pieces of the Dutch, the L in Rockley Vale <laughs> and the L in Rockley B. Fine, thank you. <laughs> well, Fine. don't forget there is uh, John de Moor. Uh, yes, John de Moor. Uh, uh, John the Moore um, Street, Street or, or, or yes, that, that area, the area, yeah, yeah, John well, the it, area and Dutch forts. Yeah, right, 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 right. Good. Okay, so we now have four pieces. Good. Okay. So, um, someone asked about the maps that that you used in your presentation. Um, you can answer that, but I can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, a lot of the maps used by right, Dr. Pemberton in her um, presentation, um, some of them are available online. I helped her with some of some getting some of the maps. Um, um, I don't know if they're available in the Tobago Heritage Library. Um, or if you can access, maybe Dr. Pemberton, you could, you could shed some light if, if the Heritage No, I don't know if they are. I will have the Tobago Heritage Library. I, yeah. I doubt. I doubt. Yeah. yeah, but but some of them I got most of them from um, the Library of Congress um, website, the US Library of Congress website, which is a fantastic repository of um, you know maps and, and other documents from all over the world. And I got some of them as well from uh, I can't remember that website. But I can I can make that information available. Um, another question. Let's see. Um Someone asks, is it possible to know what was traded in the First Peoples Trading Route see, that you mentioned? And again, this may be a question. <laughs> that, no, um, I, I can say, I, I can say okay. some of that, uh, you know. Okay. Um, okay. They traded beads, for example. They traded all the items that they required. And Tobago was known for a particular kind of bead and that was traded. But, but you know, everything, um, 
everything that was was uh, produced in at once one part of the region was traded up to the other part of the region. So some tools, you know, the 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 the, the lifestyle of the indigenous people was very different to the European lifestyle. So they were trading in the things like they, they like the feathers, uh, dye colors, you know, for, for uh, decorative purposes and so on. Okay. So um, someone asked about the 1677 battle. And we learned last week from Dr. Bashkarov mm -hmm. that um, before the battle took place, um, the enslaved Africans who were on on the island were um, sequestered to one of the merchant ships in the, in the harbor um, while the battle was, was taking place. So this person asks, what happened to the enslaved Africans after 1677, as they could not have been all killed um, in the ship with the Dutch women and children? So, well, yeah, some were killed in that ship, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, the records suggest, uh, the re written records, that is, suggest that some of them were captured by the indigenous people and carted off to other places. And so as far, and some of them, it was also said, took a refuge in the forest. So I am not sure what happened to those, but I, I, would, I would believe that they would be, would have been acquired by whichever European power came in. And so the problem of the enslaved Africans is that they were used for fighting purposes by all the Europeans. So they fought as with the British, they fought with the French, so an opportunity like that would have afforded one of the rivals to try to capture if they were you know, within, within reach of the island at the point in time. And they were all hanging around anyhow. And then you also had pirates, mm -hmm. right? So I, I, I would think that would explain it. I, I don't see that there was a possibility of any mass movement of enslaved Africans from Tobago, even during the turmoil that occurred on the Cuba. Okay. Um, another question, thank you for that answer. Another question, um, have you been able to confirm from your research which yeah. Europeans first landed on Tobago as Christopher Columbus sighted but did not land when leaving Trinidad through the five islands on his return to Spain? So, uh, yeah. The, the, the problem with identifying first is that everybody who went there claim to see nobody else of consequence and so they were first. So you would have had several first. I mean, there are several <laughs> writers who claim. So if you went on this leeward side and if you went to the, the, the northern side or if you went on the, on, on the um, <clears throat> sorry, eastern side of the island, then uh, you, you saw nobody else or, or you refused to see anybody else and then you claim first. So I could not say specifically who was the first European who landed. You have early reports uh, descriptions of the island from various people, but to say who was first, who second, or third, I really can't. I wouldn't like to to, to guess. Mm -hmm. And we we have a lot of questions coming in about the first peoples. I'd just like to say that um, Dr. Boomer will have a lecture in December, so a lot of you know maybe archaeological questions or questions specifically related to the first peoples as well be answered in, in December. Um, but I will, I could still ask you those questions, Dr. Pemberton. Mm -hmm. I will try. I'm not an archaeologist. <laughs> I can't pretend to be one. I can't dive. I can't dig. I'm not, well, I did go on a dig once, once or okay. twice, yes. Okay, so um, someone asked, could you tell us a bit more about the Nepoyo? In, because um, you mentioned them in your, in your presentation. Yeah, that was a group of first people that lived in Trinidad. They, they, that, they were a Trinidad-based group. And as I said, there was trading between the various groups uh, via Tobago. So um, I have not studied in Epoyo, I, I, so I, I can't give you any further details at this point in time about them. But just to say that they occupied mainly the, the Toko, Toko area, right? East, East Trinidad. Okay. Um... Moving on now, someone asks about the Bell Vista ruins. Is this, um, is it, is locating these ruins a, a possible job for the Tobago History Conservation Society? I think that's what the person is trying to say. Yes, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it would be a challenge for them, yes. 
it is something it's it, it was but it was a, a small redo it was temporary a temporary installation so i don't know if in the passage of time but it is worth investigation um someone asked what is the possibility of inviting archaeologists to expose some of this heritage to boost tourism to the tourism effort it's a fantastic question and well i think it's a fantastic <laughs> idea yeah i don't know <laughs> you, you, there will have to be some involvement of the Tobago House of Assembly. So I think that question should be posed most properly to, well, after elections, to whoever is administering the Tobago House of Assembly. And it is something that could be brought to the attention of the tourism, um, what's it, the tourism organization. Uh, it, it should be the kind of thing that would interest them. Between so between the House of Assembly, the tourism organization, and the interested historical groups in Tobago, uh, who could advocate for such a development. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. So someone asked, listening to the names of the Dutch. Now explain to me what they say. Now explain to me many of the names given to places in and around Tobago. So they got a lot of um, information from your lecture. Um, they're, they're asking, is there any document or book available for perusal to further explain the history behind the names in Tobago? So I'm, I'm thinking toponyms and place names is what they're getting at. That is what toponyms are and place names. Um, they are, there's not a book. They are there are um, mentions in some of the texts, but the numbers of Dutch words and Dutch names are very few. And some of the ones that people regard as Dutch are not Dutch at all. So I, I, I will, I will uh, make mention. <laughs> um, now I'm forgetting the name of the road, but there's this, right, right where, 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 where Republic Bank has its, its, um, big installation now. The big bank, Republic Bank. Orkinskio yeah. has traditionally been regarded as a Dutch word, but it's no. very Scottish. No. Very Scottish. <laughs> yeah, quite. Yeah. It's definitely not Dutch. It is, uh, like you say, Gaelic. Yes. Like spoken in uh, Western Scotland and Wales and, and, and uh, parts of Ireland still spoken. It's, uh, that is that it, it means uh, something like many streams. Many streams. And, and that yeah. applies to the Oxcombe's Cure um, plantation. Which was yes. There. Uh, there, was a, there, was a, there is a Scottish castle. Right. Oxcombe's Cure castle. And by the way, speaking about Dutch toponyms, I may add that I wrote an article on that <laughs> a number of years ago. <laughs> so, I think, I, coming to think of it, I must have seen it. Oh, well. Um, and, and Some time I, ago. I, I listed all the names which were became yeah, Gallicized in the 18th century. Unchanged. And, and, yes. and, and Anglicized and Gallicized and what? And, and all kinds of size, yes. All yes. kinds of size. Or yeah, right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm gonna ask a hard question now. Yes. Do you have any concerns um, related to the preservation of artifacts with the plan construction at Rockley Bay? And if so, what do you recommend should be done to ensure the pieces of history, the pieces of history is conserved? Let me, let me just ask a question here. How much has been paid for that consultancy? <laughs> now, <laughs> now, the thing is, I believe all artifacts could be preserved. I believe that before any construction is undertaken, the site should be examined carefully for such artifacts that can provide us with information of past activities in the, on the island and anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So there's value to it, but the problem we have is convincing not only the administration, but I think there should be some mechanism 
by which developers, people who operate um, tractors and excavators, I spoke to uh, such a person some years ago, and I was told, yes, we find things, and if we, if, if we, if we find things, we just throw it somewhere else and press on. So there has been some of that happening because there has been, as far as I know, no attempt to inform land development activity, um, act activists, people involved in land development, that this is something that should be taken seriously. And that if you excavate a site and you find something of that kind of value, don't just throw it away, discard it, or put it on your the dressing table in your house, because it, it, it would be an important signifier that would be of value to the heritage and the knowledge of the island's heritage as well. Okay, thank you so much for that comment. Um, I share I share those sentiments as an archaeologist, definitely. Um, okay, so this is an interesting question here. Um, before I go through that, I'm just saying that a lot of a lot some people in the chat have you know given us a lot of places where we can get information on the cartographic records and the maps and so forth. So we thank you for that. Um, from that question that was asked about the, the maps that was, in the, that was in the presentation. So if you can, um, you can go to the, the chat and you can see um, a lot of resources have been uh, listed there. Right, so next question. Uh, it's about Storby. So this person asks if the origin of the name Storby um, comes from a Dutch sailor that was named Mr. Store, um, it, they're asking if this is, um, if you can confirm this, the name Storby. Well, I, I can't confirm that at all. Mm -hmm. I just grew up knowing it as Storby and a bay that you don't go and bathe in. I, I, I don't know anything else. Okay. All right. Okay, um, moving forward. Lots of questions, lots of questions. Okay, so someone asks, I own an 18th century map of Tobago. It mentions the remains of a fort and house in the Dutch taste on an outcrop separating Great and Small Coraline Bay. Has this been related to a fort known from other sources? So they're asking about um, a possibility of a fort being located between Great and Small Coraline Bay. Between Great and Small Colland Bay, yeah. the Dutch had at Great Colland, the Colanders had at Great Colland, Small Colland. Yeah, it might well be. I mean, it has to be investigated to to be sure that you know what it, what its origins are. Mm -hmm. So I, I I have not seen the site, but somebody, some archaeologists. Uh, could look at, at the building if it's still standing and, and determine its origins. You refer to the Rocky Point uh, establishment? Development. Right, right, yes. right. I saw that years ago, and uh, at the time it still had uh, a few guns, and um, it had a uh, uh, yeah, uh, bricks and, and, and all that kind of thing. It was a small fort, but- A small fort. Yes, and uh, it was definitely a small fort in the uh, times of the British in the uh, 1770s, 1780s, when they first uh, uh, established uh, or, or got Tobago as one of the ceded islands after the Seven Years' War, they established uh, a fort there because uh, Plymouth was considered to become uh, the, 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 uh, the, yeah, the major uh, town and it never materialized and it became uh, Scarborough, of course. But uh, that Rocky Point fort may, and I, I say may, have been uh, originally 
a, a Corlander place uh, because there was a, uh, the Corlanders had in the now 1680s uh, a, a fortress in that area. And that may have been uh, the same place where the British later on uh, built a battery. There's more there, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Remnants still exist. I saw it a couple of weeks ago, and um, there are remnants. Uh, Professor Beaumont, there aren't any cannons or anything there, uh, but uh, the remnants of the fortification are there. Okay. Well, the guns were there years ago, and they must have been uh, taken away. Removed. Yeah. But, but what, what you will also. pictures of them. So, and they show the, um, the English. Uh, no, Tudor Rose, Tudor Rose, and these are guns which were uh, manufactured until the 1680s or something, something like that. So if they, well, they could have been used 100 years later as well, of course, but they date from the 17th century. Uh, well, the, if they have disappeared, that disappeared, but I've seen yeah, so but one, of, one of the things we are going to find with Tobago, though, is that you would find forts or small military establishments around the island, uh, particularly in the north, where, you know, communication was a little difficult with the rest of the island, you would find. So, so a lot of those things have not been found. I mean, things are, are cannon and stuff are turning up uh, underneath people's houses and so on. So the, I think there's a whole world of information to be had by a proper archeological study of the entire island. Quiet, hopefully we can get to that in the, the near future. Um, um, I'd like to, to thank you, Dr. Pemberton, for, for answering these questions. And I'd also okay, like to see, like. Dr. Guy? Here, you give me one second. Give me one second. So, um, I just wanted to say, um, thank you for the questions, Dr. Pember. Thank you for answering the questions. Dr. Hello, Pemberton. good morning and, um, again. What? And, Dr. Pemberton, thank you for your okay. very interesting lecture. Uh, you touched on a lot of issues that um, we all wanted to know. And um, I think I'm very grateful for all the issues that were touched. And also we are going to have lecturers who will touch on the specifics. I just wanna highlight that next week, we will have Professor Nigel Nailing. He's the chair of the Department of Archeology span at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. And his topic is gonna to be floating forests Dendro chronology of shipbuilding. So he would be next week at 10 o'clock. I would also like to say that we will touch on Yan de Moor, also the Dutch West India Company. We have two lecturers who would touch on this uh, very timely topic as it relates to the Dutch in the Caribbean. I would also like to make a listing um, thanking the individuals and organizations that have been involved in this process, starting with the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Ambassador Varga and Mr. Lindley Giban, or Trade Officer, the Trade Officer at the Embassy, the Ministry of Culture in the Netherlands and the Director Professor Martijn Manders, the Maritime Museum of Vlissinga, the University of Leiden, the Institute of Social History, Amsterdam University, the Spanish National Research Council, the University of Wales at Trinity St. David, the University of Connecticut, the Tobago Trust, the Tobago Library Services, the Division of Culture, Tourism, Culture and Transportation in Tobago, the Tobago Heritage and Cultural Society, the Angelo Bissessing Virtual Museum, Phillipsburg Jubilee Library, 
the Department of Education and Culture in St. Martin, the Curacao Maritime Museum. And I also would like to express my sincere gratitude to all the lecturers who have volunteered to participate, including our own Dr. Rita Pemberton. And I cannot leave without expressing gratitude to the trust, the National Trust, the National Historic Trust of Trinidad and Tobago under the, the leadership chairman, Margaret McDowell, and the work that has been done with Ashley, Ashley Morris, who is our coordinator, and Mr. Graham Sweet, and the other members of the trust. Thank you, and I wish to see you next week at 10 o'clock, where you would listen to Professor Nigel Neely from the University of Wales. Okay. So, Dr. Pemberton, would you like to say something as we end? No, oh, I just want to thank everybody. Thanks, thanks um, the uh, attendees for their questions. Uh, thanks to Professor Boomud for his presentation. And thanks again to Dr. Guy and her team and the groups who supported this endeavor. I think, again, I would say it's a very important intervention is providing um, some light in those dark areas of our history. So thanks to everyone. Thanks to you for the assistance with the PowerPoint because I, um, I confess I don't have those technical skills. So I just did the content and I sent it to him and he agreed to do it and presented me with what was quite shocking to me. I didn't expect anything like that. So thank you, thank you, Ashley, and thank everybody else. And Jerome, thank you for your kind introduction. Okay, and um, one last thing, um, I'd like to, I hope everyone here is a member of the National Trust. And if you are not a member of the National Trust, you can visit our website, www.nationaltrust.tt and you can become a member and you can support us in, in these endeavors. Thank you so yes. much and have a good weekend everyone. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you, bye-bye.